For years, I managed a winery that made box wine. We filled over 10 million bags a year, and let me tell you, there are many, many ways box wines can fail. Most of these are resolved at the winery well before the wine gets to the grocery store, but there are three modes of failure that can affect the wine after you buy it and bring it home. We'll talk about these three common problems, and I'll let you know how to avoid each of them. Hi, my name is Eric. Grab yourself a glass of box wine, and let's get started. I'm actually a fan of box wine, or as we call them in the industry, bag-and-box wines. First off, no special tool is needed to open them. Then there's the fact that they have only about 60% of the carbon footprint of glass bottles. That's a major reason why we're now starting to see box wines in the ultra-premium and luxury categories. Best of all, they last for several weeks, if not a month or more, after they're opened. To understand why this is, and to understand the first mode of failure we'll be talking about here in just a minute, let's take a look at how box wines work. When you pour a glass of wine from a bottle, the volume of wine you pour out is replaced by air, and the contact of that air with the remaining wine causes oxidation, which is why an opened bottle is typically only good for about three days before it starts to smell like raisins, prunes, soy sauce, sherry, or other things that detract from the wine's intended aroma. Sure, you could use a Coravin or some other equipment to minimize oxidation in the bottle, but that's yet another special and often expensive tool. In contrast, when you fill a glass from a bag and box, the bag just collapses as the wine exits and no air gets inside. So after you open a box wine, it's good for several weeks instead of just a couple of days. This works because the bag is made of flexible plastic. It's special plastic that's designed to keep oxygen out, but a tiny amount of oxygen does get through. The rate of oxygen ingress, called the oxygen transmission rate, or OTR, is pretty much constant over time. Although tiny, it adds up over days, weeks, and months, and this is why the shelf life of the wine before you open it is roughly a year. Here's a super important point that's key to understanding the limitations of the bag and box package. The more wine you have in the bag, the more oxygen it can deal with before quality starts to suffer. So every time you dispense a glass, there's less wine left in the bag to deal with the same rate of incoming oxygen. And that's also why we don't often see bag and box wines smaller than three liters. Any smaller, and the oxygen transmission rate to volume ratio, means you have a much shorter shelf life both before and after opening the package. So that's our first mode of failure, excessive oxidation. So how do you prevent it? The most likely reason for excessive oxidation is that the wine has been in the bag too long. In my opinion, every box wine should have either a packaged on date or a best before date printed on it. If it doesn't, don't buy it. If the wine has a packaged on date, as long as you're drinking it within about a year of that date, you should be good. And a best before date is even better because it's self-explanatory and you don't have to do any math. If a box doesn't have a date on it, the wine might still be good, but the lack of a date says to me that either the winery doesn't understand the bag and box package, or they care more about getting your money than they do about ensuring you have an enjoyable experience. Before we move on, I should note that when box wine expires, it won't make you sick, it just won't taste its best. Thanks to the alcohol and acidity in wine, no known human pathogens can live in wine. So a spoiled wine isn't unsafe, it's just unpleasant. Now, I'm only talking about real wine here. This doesn't necessarily apply to the alcohol-free, wine-like laboratory concoctions that are appearing on the market these days. The next two modes of failure have to do with the tap. Here are the three most common taps for box wine. The first is the twist tap. The second is what I call a lift tap. There are several versions of this tap on the market. Vitop, iTap, and Viniflow are some examples. I've seen these referred to generically as pull taps, but I think lift tap is a better term because they're activated by lifting an internal mechanism with the protruding wings. Third, we have the flex tap, which features a front button. This is my favorite tap because it's so intuitive, but unfortunately this tap is the most susceptible to our second mode of failure. Picture this, you've got a box of Chardonnay chilling in the refrigerator and it's finally time to pop it open and have a glass. The box goes back in the fridge, and you go off to enjoy your wine. 
For the next time you open the fridge, you discover that half the contents of the box have leaked inside the refrigerator. As I mentioned, the flex tap is the most susceptible to this type of failure. Can you guess what happened? Here's a hint. These two side flanges are there specifically to help prevent this from happening. When we closed the refrigerator door, something pushed the button opening the tap. So the side flanges help protect against accidental activation, but it's not foolproof. So why doesn't the protective flange go all the way around the button? One time we had a prospective vendor demo a new tap that they had designed. It was a front button tap and it had a flange all the way around the button. But as one of the women on the team noted, if you had long fingernails, you couldn't get your finger in past the flange to push the button. And I'll never forget, the tap made a clicking sound when you pushed it. That same colleague of mine told the vendor that was a no-go. She didn't want her husband in the living room to hear the click when she refilled her glass in the kitchen. So the best way to prevent accidental activation of the tap is, if you're going to put the box in a cabinet or refrigerator, just make sure there's room behind the box. That way, a bit of force on the front when you close the door will just slide the box back instead of activating the tap. The solution to our next tap-related mode of failure actually helps ensure that every glass tastes good. This is a tip I've never seen anywhere else, so you heard it here first. It turns out that after you finish dispensing wine, there's inevitably a drop or two of wine still stuck in the spout. We don't want that dripping out of the tap and making a mess. Even though it's a small amount, how annoyed would you be if after every glass, a few minutes later, a drip leaves the tap and splashes on your floor or countertop? So to prevent this, bag and box taps are designed to retain that drop or two inside the spout so it doesn't make a mess. But that means you have that little bit of old wine up in the spout when you go to pour your next glass. While that drop or two is a tiny volume compared to what's in your glass, it's possible that it could negatively impact quality. So I recommend giving the tap a quick flick or two at the end of your pour, knocking those remaining drops into your glass and clearing the spout so it's ready to go for next time. So now you know how to avoid excessive oxidation, how to prevent accidental tap activation, and you know that you should flick the tap each time after filling your glass. So go forth and enjoy box wine with confidence. Cheers. So as always, thank you for watching until the end of the video. One of the big projects here at the farm was putting in this pond, which will be used for irrigation and frost protection of the future vineyard. It's fed by this waterfall, and I'll drop in a clip of the waterfall being constructed. It just allows the water to go from the stream down into the pond without creating a bunch of erosion. And as you can see, it's just a bunch of natural stones stacked on each other. The pond is a little over half an acre in surface area. The main dam is back there, and that there is the barrel that the pond overflows into. And then the water drops down and goes through a pipe that goes through the bottom of the dam. And I've built a wooden structure there that's going to be a swimming platform, but finishing that is a project for this upcoming summer. I also put in two three inch and one one inch supply pipes to pull water from the pond. And they go through a trench over to that little box right there. And that's where the pumps will sit to pump water up to the future vineyard, which is over in that area. So in addition to being a functioning ag pond, this is also just a pretty spot to hang out. So I'll close out this video with a few before and after pictures of the pond. So we'll see you on the next one. Take care.